Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here, continuing on with Lecture 36, now moving into female anatomy and physiology. Yep. So let's start with the external genitalia. So the external genitalia of the female is the vulva. Uh, so it's a pet peeve of mine that sometimes people say, oh, it's penis or vagina. Uh, the vagina is an internal structure. You can't see it on the outside uh, in that famous scene from Pitch Perfect 2. We didn't see Fat Amy's vagina. We saw her vulva. But anyway, so the vulva is composed of several features. So we have the labia majora, which are the larger folds folds, the outer skin folds. This is made of kind of typical skin, typical hair bearing skin. And then between the two labia majora, we will find the labia minora or the smaller lips, right? So one here and one here. And these are a very different type of skin. It's very thin, it's hairless. Uh, and so they, um, now normally, so I also want to say, always in diagrams of vulvas, everything is kind of spread open for you. This is not how things normally look, right? Um, but anyway. And then, of course, we have the clitoris. Only a tiny portion of the clitoris is visible externally, but it actually travels deep to the vulva and kind of it has a wishbone shape. There's actually a lot more to the clitoris than you can see. And the clitoris is composed of erectile tissue, just like those columns of erectile tissue in the penis. And it can engorge with arousal, just like the penis, uh, but it's not visible uh, very much because it's deep to the skin. So it's a sexual response organ, and it's also covered by a hood of skin, kind of like the foreskin, but it's called uh, a prepice or the clitoral hood. And there's this little bit of skin here that covers the surface. So in between the two labia minora, and let me erase this because it's getting very busy. So in between the two labia minora, we're going to find several important structures. Here is the external urethral orifice, right, where urine comes out. And then down here we have the vaginal orifice or the opening to the vagina which may or may not be partially covered by a membrane called the hymen so you can see this picture down uh, bottom right and there's lots of different variations of hymens so this would be kind of a, a hymen that's covering most of the vaginal opening this would be someone who has uh, the hymen has been ruptured or broken either due to sexual intercores or using tampons or just life or horseback riding or whatever it might be, right? So an intact hymen is not a good indicator of virginity, just so you know. And then sometimes there can be some kind of, these are kind of some abnormal variants of hymen. Sometimes there can be a little band of tissue down the middle. Sometimes there's just lots of little openings. Hymens are very interesting. So there's lots of things to be found in the female vulva. I also want to point out that vulvas look very different from person to person. So your generation is unique in that you have more access to pornography than any preceding generations. And a lot of the people who work in the porn industry have vulvas that look a certain way. And so you may have an idea of what a vulva is supposed to look like that may actually be very different from the normal variation that we see in humans. And um, vulvoplasty, or plastic surgery to change the appearance of the vulva is actually one of the fastest growing plastic surgeries because of this, because people look at their own anatomy, they say, well, I don't look like that porn star, so something must be wrong with me. And then undergo painful and potentially scarring surgeries to alter the appearance of their vulvas. So I just wanna show you, vulvas um, have all different shapes and sizes. These are drawings by Betty Dodson, who is an incredible artist who has tried to kind of highlight the fact that there's all different kinds of shapes and sizes of vulvas out there. So let's take a look at the female internal organs. And so just really quick overview, we're going to go through these one at a time, but we have the vagina, right? And then the cervix is where the vagina meets the uterus. We have fallopian tubes, one on each side, and ovaries, one on each side. 
So the vagina has several functions, of course, intercourse, childbirth, and passage of the menstrual blood. It's a muscular expansile tube. It's about three to four inches long, and it has accordion-like folds in it called rugae, just like the stomach did, that allow it to expand, right? And most of the time, if there's nothing inside the vagina, it's closed, kind of like a sock, right? But it can expand and you know, a baby can fit through thanks to those rugae. Also, the inside of the vaginal canal is lined by our old friend stratified squamous epithelium. And you'll remember that we see stratified squamous epithelium in places that need to be durable and resilient, right? So it's many cell layers thick, many cell layers before you get to uh, blood vessels and nerves, which is good, right? So we also have stratified squamous epithelium on the insides of our cheeks and lining the inside of our esophagus. It's what allows me to eat potato chips without <laughs> making the inside of my mouth a bloody mess, right? If it was simple squamous, it would be very different. So we also find that same epithelium lining the inside of the vagina. Now, a normal healthy vagina has bacteria that live in it. There are certain bacteria called lactobacilli and a few others that are normal healthy bacteria for the vagina, and they actually keep it healthy. One of the things that they do is they keep the vagina acidic. They maintain that acidic pH. Normal pH for a vagina is about three and a half to four. And what this does is it helps decrease the ability of other unhealthy bacteria to grow in the vagina. So it's not just to be mean to sperm, it's actually part of what keeps the vagina healthy. So um, that low pH helps to keep unhealthy microbes or bacteria and yeast and other things out. Also just having the normal healthy bacteria in there, they can outcompete uh, the potential pathogenic uh, organisms, so that also helps. The vagina will self-lubricate during arousal for sexual activity, but this varies a lot from person to person. In some people, it's not quite enough for sexual activity, and that's why you'll see lubricants sold um, in pharmacies and, and other places for sure. Um, so if you need those, use them. Uh, there's no shame in that. And I also want to point out that it's normal for people who own a vagina for there to be small amounts of clear to whitish to yellowish discharge. That's common and it's normal. We don't recommend that people wear panty liners on a daily basis because that keeps moisture close to the vulva and can increase your risk of yeast infections. Also, those panty liners often have fragrances in them or adhesives or bleach or other compounds that can actually be really irritating to the vulvar skin. So it's not recommended. Now, if you have a lot of discharge or irritation or itching or the discharge smells really bad and fishy, well, that's not normal and it means that there's an infection or some other problem going on that should be investigated. So at the top of the vagina, we will find the cervix. So here's the vagina here. And at the top of it, we find the cervix. And this is a small, round, firm structure. It has kind of the same feel to it as if, if you touch the tip of your nose or the tip of your chin. It kind of has that same kind of feeling. It's not made out of cartilage, however, but this contains the opening from the vagina into the uterus. So this image that we see in the upper right is someone doing a vaginal exam with a speculum. So this is a speculum here. It's an instrument that we use to look inside the vagina because as I mentioned, it's normally closed unless there's something inside of it. So speculums are smaller than a penis. So that one is shown open, but we'll insert them closed and then we open them like you can see so that we can actually see inside the vagina. So here is the lower, blade right of the speculum here is the upper blade and we can see the cervix at the top of the vagina and right here this little tiny opening here that is the opening up into the uterus and so I also want to point out that that opening is very small it's big enough to allow sperm in for sure it's also big enough for soft gushy menstrual blood and stuff to come out uh, but it's small enough that you never have to worry about something getting lost in the vagina and somehow making its way up into the pelvis or up into your lungs right 
So sometimes people lose a condom or something like that, or a tampon, and they're worried that it could somehow get up into the rest of their body. That's not going to happen. So this is on the order of millimeters, this opening um, from the vagina into the uterus. The cervix is also interesting because there are some cells on it that are vul vulnerable to certain cancers caused by HPV or the human papilloma virus. That's one of the reasons that many of you received the HPV vaccine is to decrease the risk of cervical cancer in your own bodies or that of your partners. Uh, we'll discuss that later when we talk about STIs, but it's an interesting factoid about the cervix. So the cervix then leads up into the uterus, which you might think of as the womb, right? This is where a baby would grow. There's a little baby, <laughs> okay, is inside the uterus. And so the uterus is divided into three different layers. So the innermost layer is going to be named the endometrium, because of course endo means inner or on the inside of, and that's this layer here. And this is the layer that can thicken up e each month in hopes of a pregnancy occurring. If no pregnancy occurs, that endometrium is going to break down and be shed as a menstrual period. Then we have a middle layer, which is the thickest layer of the uterus, and it's called the myometrium. And you remember myo is the prefix that means muscle, and this is actually made of smooth muscle. And so this smooth muscle, right, it's involuntary, will contract in labor, and this is what's going to push the baby out. It also contracts during menstrual periods to get the menstrual blood and tissue out of the uterus, that broken down endometrium out of the uterus, and that is what causes menstrual cramps, are those contractions of the smooth muscle in that that myometrium. Finally, we have an, a layer around the outside, so just the very outer, oh, I did a terrible job drawing there, but the very outer membrane covering the uterus is the perimetrium, so peri as a prefix means around the outside of, like perimeter, so the perimetrium is that outermost layer. Next, we have the fallopian tubes, and the fallopian tubes have these interesting little frond-like, finger-like projections at the ends of them called fimbriae, and they kind of go and try to kind of wave and suck an egg that's been released from the ovary into the fallopian tubes. Once inside the fallopian tubes, we have an old friend, ciliated columnar epithelium. And so those cilia on top of the columnar cells go whoosh, 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 and they beat in a fashion that creates a current that goes this way. So it sucks the oocyte or the egg in the fallopian tube and down toward the uterus. That's really important because we don't want a baby trying to grow out in the fallopian tubes, right? We need it to get here into the uterus. Now that takes time, and so the sperm usually ends up meeting the egg, and fertilization typically occurs in the fallopian tube, but the cilia continue to do their job and wave that fertilized egg down into the uterus. Finally, we have the ovaries. So remember, when we talked about gonads, they have two functions, make hormones and make sex cells. So in case of the ovaries, the hormones are gonna be estrogen and progesterone, and the gonad, or the gametes, or sex cells, are gonna be oocytes, or eggs, right? So we're gonna make estrogen and progesterone, and we're gonna make oocytes. And you're like, oh, and so the hypothalamus makes GnRH, and that causes the pituitary gland to make LH and FSH, yes, but things get a little bit more complicated in the case of the female reproductive system. So let's talk about why. So about once per month, the goal is to release one oocyte, only once per month. Now the male reproductive system, I don't think I mentioned this, but they make about 250 million sperm per day. So they're definitely going for the quantity over quality right strategy. In the female reproductive system, we're going more for quality over quantity. So only one per month, and we're going to give it a chance and see if we get pregnant. This also helps avoid us having multiple gestations, twins, triplets, um, quads, right? Because the human body isn't well designed to do that, unlike a cat or a dog or a pig, right? They, they can do that fine, but we can't. 
So we only want to release one oocyte per month. So we're going to start with an immature oocyte or egg cell in an immature follicle. And that's going to look like this. And a follicle is a collection of cells surrounding that oocyte and supporting it. So it starts with an immature one, and then as the oocyte matures, the follicle will also mature. So you can see it's growing here. And then eventually, it's going to fill with fluid and become a mature or graphene follicle. Once that occurs, there's going to be a series of events that cause that follicle to burst open and release the oocyte, release the egg. That's called ovulation. The empty follicle, instead of just being like, okay, I'm done, I can go home now, the empty follicle is going to still keep working. It's going to turn into something called the corpus luteum. Now, that sounds very fancy, but in Latin, corpus just means a body or a thing, and luteum means golden. So literally, that word just means yellow thing, <laughs> because when they cut open an ovary and they looked at it, they were like, oh, what's this yellow thing? So they called it the corpus luteum, which sounds much more dignified than yellow thing, but there we go. So the empty follicle becomes the corpus luteum. And what the corpus luteum does is it produces progesterone. That progesterone is going to thicken the endometrial lining in hopes of the egg getting fertilized and a pregnancy being established. If, however, no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum is then going to degenerate. It's going to give up turn into the white thing called the corpus albicans, and then it's going to stop making progesterone. So that is the ovarian cycle and is going to end up dictating the menstrual cycle, which we're going to talk about next. Before we do, I want to show you a few microscopic images of ovaries. So this is a low power view of some immature follicles in the ovary. Let me pick a different color here. Right? So we've got several immature follicles, right? Look how small they are. Tiny, tiny, tiny little things. And so the follicles are always located near the outer edge of the ovaries. They're always out in the cortex. Remember, cortex means like the outer rind. That's where we will find the follicles. And there's several more immature follicles here. So that's how you start with an immature oocyte and an immature follicle. And then the follicles are going to start to grow. So we can see here's a very immature one. Here's a couple of other ones here. This one is starting to get a little bit more mature. The cells surrounding the oocyte are getting bigger and thicker. This is the oocyte in here, uh, but it's still relatively small. Now here's the one that's gotten quite a bit larger. So this is a much lower power uh, view than our previous one. This is the oocyte. It's gotten quite large. And all of these little purple dots are individual cells surrounding the oocyte. And so here's the whole follicle here. And you can see it's also starting to fill with fluid. This is a sign that this is almost mature, right? It's really getting there. And so here's an example of this one's not quite there, but it's just about there. So of a mature or graphene follicle. So the inside is almost entirely filled with fluid. We have the oocyte here surrounded by some cells. And once it gets fully mature, that oocyte is actually going to get pushed to the side and there won't be any more kind of islands of cells out here. It'll just be all fluid. We can also see here a lower power view of that other follicle that's not as mature but starting to get there because it's starting to accumulate fluid. And here's a closer up view of that nearly mature or graphene follicle. Here's the oocyte here and you can see all of those supporting cells around her. All right, so this brings us to the menstrual cycle. So first of all, we talk about the menstrual cycle in 28 day increments. That is the average duration from one menstrual period to the next, okay? So in some people it's more like 26, in some people it's 32, in some people it's 35. It varies from person to person, but the population average is approximately 28 days. So that's the example that we're going to use. So we divide the menstrual cycle up into two phases. We have the first part is the follicular phase, and the second part is the luteal phase, and the demarcation line between the two of them is ovulation. So let's go through each of those three distinct portions of the menstrual cycle in turn. 
So follicular phase. So follicular phase is named for what's happening. During this phase, we failed to get pregnant last month, so we're going to start developing new follicles again this month, right? So hence the name follicular phase because we're focused on growing and developing new follicles. So one of the things that often throws students off is that what's happening with the uterus is that we're getting rid of the endometrium from the last period. <laughs> or from the last menstrual cycle, right? So we didn't get pregnant, so we're having our period. So at the very beginning of the follicular phase, menses, which is the menstrual period, is occurring. And estrogen and progesterone levels are low, so the hypothalamus is going to start making GnRH, which is going to cause the pituitary to make LH and FSH, and that's what stimulates the maturation and development of the follicles and the oocytes, right? Because LH and FSH tell the ovary to do its thing. When we move into the second week of the follicular phase, right, continued maturation is occurring, estrogen levels start to go up, and the endometrium also starts to thicken because of those increasing levels of estrogen under that influence of the LH and FSH from the pituitary, which was getting the GnRH from the hypothalamus. So that's the follicular phase. It's kind of what, it's very similar to what we saw in the male reproductive system, but things are about to change. So ovulation, this is so cool. So what happens is, here's our estradiol level and it was starting to really go up and it gets into a positive feedback loop with LH, which is luteinizing hormone. So estradiol goes up, which causes LH to go up, which causes estradiol to go up, which causes LH to go up, right? So positive feedback mechanism, it builds, 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 builds until something explosive happens. And what the explosive thing, the explosive event here is ovulation. So that ramping up, 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 of LH and FS, or excuse me, LH and estrogen causes that follicle to get so big and full with fluid that it basically pops like a pimple. So what we're seeing here in the image in the lower uh, part of the slide is someone was having surgery for an unrelated thing and they said hey look she's ovulating right now so this is an image of it's vastly magnified so here's the ovary here and an ovary is normally about the size of an almond right an unshelled almond so it's not very large here is the mature follicle which is bulging off of the surface of the ovary and here is the oocyte with some surrounding cells that has just been released from the follicle pretty cool all right so ovulation is the re release of the oocyte or the egg from the ovary from that mature follicle due to a positive feedback mechanism between lh and estrogen so now we're going to move into the second phase, the luteal phase. Because you will remember that empty follicle becomes the corpus luteum. That's why we call it the luteal phase, because it's all about the corpus luteum now. So the corpus luteum's job is to make progesterone. So what you can see is this purple line here starts to go up and up as the corpus luteum starts making progesterone. Progesterone Pro means four, gestation is pregnancy. So this is the four pregnancy hormone. So it's gonna cause that uterine lining, that endometrium to build up and get thicker and thicker and nice and juicy to receive a possible embryo. If fertilization doesn't occur, if no pregnancy occurs, then the corpus luteum is going to give up. It's going to degenerate into the corpus albicans. It's going to stop making progesterone. So progesterone levels fall, and that decrease in progesterone levels is what causes the endometrium to break down and be shed as menstrual blood. So you can see here, We've started menses again. That's the end of the luteal phase and the beginning of the next follicular phase, right? So again, look, our estrogen and progesterone levels are low. So hypothalamus is going to start making GnRH and we're going to go through the whole thing all over again. 
So there's everything together, so you can see them again. We have our follicular phase where we're growing and maturing oocytes and follicles. Ovulation due to the positive feedback between LH and estrogen causes the release of the oocyte. Empty follicle becomes the corpus luteum, so we enter the luteal phase with lots of production of progesterone causing thickening of the uterine lining. And then if no pregnancy occurs, corpus luteum gives up becomes the corpus albicans, progesterone levels fall, and the endometrium is shed as menstrual period, and we start the next phase of the next cycle. Now, what if sperm does meet egg and we do get a pregnancy? So that developing embryo makes a hormone called HCG. You might know this as the pregnancy hormone. So what HCG does is it tells the corpus luteum don't stop, right? Don't give up. Keep making progesterone. We've got one here, right? So as long as we continue to make that progesterone, then we're going to continue to have that nice uterine lining. We're going to continue to maintain that endometrium to support the pregnancy. The increasing progesterone levels then are going to exert negative feedback on the hypothalamus, which is a good thing because then the hypothalamus won't make GnRH, pituitary won't make LH and FSH, and therefore the ovaries won't try to mature a new oocyte and a new follicle, right? We're not gonna ovulate again because we already have one and we only like to do one at a time. Now, eventually, the developing placenta from the pregnancy will start making its own progesterone, and you can let the corpus luteum give up. So what you can see here in the graph in the bottom is that HCG levels will fall as you head into the second trimester as the uh, placenta starts making its own progesterone to maintain the uterine lining for itself. And HCG is, of course, the hormone that turns a pregnancy test positive. So I also just want to point out to you, because um, sometimes people freak out, if you are not pregnant, there will still be a line. <laughs> that is the control. It lets you know that the test is working and is not expired or defunct, right, or, or defective in some way. So not pregnant is one line. Pregnant is two lines, and what that test is looking for actually is the presence of that HCG hormone, which if you have it circulating in your bloodstream, some of it will end up in your urine, thanks to your kidneys. All right. So in summary, we've talked about male anatomy and physiology, the glands, shaft, external urethral orifice, and the prepus or foreskin of the penis, as well as the fact that it's composed of three columns of erectile tissue. The scrotum, which is a skin-covered pouch containing the two testes that have their seminiferous tubules where the sperm are produced. The epididymis, that coiled tubule where they're stored, and then the vas deferens, which can then move them up and out of the scrotum and into the pelvis. Internally, that vas deferens continues over the superior border of the urinary bladder. You have one on each side and then goes posteriorly where you're going to meet the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles are going to secrete their fluid into the ejaculatory duct, which is what we call the continuation of the vas deferens. And then we enter the prostate, which also secretes fluid into what is now the prostatic urethra. We're also going to see those bubble urethral glands that make some pre-ejaculate, some mucousy fluid that clears out the urethra just before ejaculation. Regulation in the male is a negative feedback system. Hypothalamus makes GnRH, which causes the pituitary to make LH and FSH, which stimulates the testes to produce sperm and testosterone. If testosterone levels get high, then the hypothalamus will shut down its production of GnRH, pituitary won't make LH and FSH, and the testes take a break. Eventually, testosterone levels will come down again since the testes are on break and we kind of go back. And so that negative feedback system keeps the testosterone level within a relatively narrow range at all times. Female anatomy and physiology, we have the vulva, the external genitalia with the labia major, the outer skin folds, and the minor, the inner skin folds. The clitoris, which has a hood, also called the prepus, external urethral orifice and vaginal orifice are found between labia minora. Internally, the vagina is that muscular tube with rugae or folds that allow it to expand and stratified squamous epithelium to make it resilient. It's also normally populated with healthy bacteria to maintain a low pH. The cervix is that transition from the 
vagina into the uterus. It's kind of a firm nub of tissue with that tiny opening in it. The uterus has three layers, the inner endometrium, which will build up and slough off each week for the menstrual cycle, the middle myometrium, which is made of smooth muscle for uterine contractions, and the outermost perimetrium. The fallopian tubes have fimbriae at the ends, as well as ciliated columnar epithelium to help whoosh, whoosh, move the oocyte through the fallopian tubes down into the uterus. And of course we have the ovaries. And then we talked about the ovarian and menstrual cycle. So in the follicular phase, we have menses from the leftover cycle from last month. And then we start maturing the oocyte and the follicles via the hypothalamus making GnRH, causing the pituitary to make LH and FSH, which causes the ovaries to work on maturing uh, the oocytes and follicles, and we start seeing a rise in estrogen levels. At about day 14, so the middle of the cycle, we get a positive feedback loop between estrogen and LH. They build, 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 and then phew, the follicle ruptures and releases the oocyte from the ovary. The empty follicle then becomes the corpus luteum, and we enter the luteal phase, where that corpus luteum makes progesterone, causing the endometrium to thicken and get ready for a possible pregnancy. If no pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum degenerates into the corpus albicans, the white thing, stops making progesterone, and when progesterone levels fall, the endometrium breaks down and is shed, and we start again. If pregnancy occurs, the embryo makes a hormone called HCG, which tells the corpus luteum to not degenerate, to not give up the ghost, to keep going and keep making progesterone, therefore maintaining the uterine lining, maintaining the endometrium, and so the woman does not have a period, right? So pregnancy is then established. So we'll pick up at lecture 37 talking about gametogenesis or how we actually make sperm and ova.